Welcome everyone to 6.6 .6 inverse trigonometric functions. Now in this section we have half review, right, of stuff that you've probably seen before in algebra or trig class, right? Probably trig class. Um, and then we're going to do the new stuff. We have calculus, right? How to actually take derivatives and do some integrals of some of these inverse trigonometric functions. So let's get to it. So the first thing we're going to define here is the inverse sine function. So it's denoted as the sine to the negative one. Sometimes we may call this arc sine. So this is sine inverse. Uh, it has a domain from negative one to one and a range from negative pi over two to pi over two. And we define it like we do most of our inverses, right? So sine inverse of x is equal to y if and only if sine of y equals x. And this is for all of these values uh, in the range. So y from negative pi over two to pi over two. Now, like inverse, functions have, right, there are cancellation equations, which say that the inverse cancels with the original function. Likewise, if you apply the original function to the inverse, it'll also cancel. And so then you just get what you put in, x. And we have to be a little bit careful, right, there are different domains on these things. So this one, you have to be able to plug in x into sine inverse. So it's got to be from negative one to one. And then up here, we'd have to be able to plug it into sine uh, in the area that it actually has an inverse. So that's going to be from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2. All right, the last thing is that we can actually take the derivative of this thing. So the derivative, my claim to you, is that it's supposed to be 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. And now our derivative is a little bit more restrictive. It's between negative 1 and 1, but not including it. So let's spend a little bit of time. Uh, this is a theorem. One could actually prove this. So let's actually spend a little bit of time talking about how one would prove this. Right? So I'm just going to make a quick little side note down here. I'm going to write in green. So the way that you prove this is not really with logarithmic differentiation, but just rather the good old implicit differentiation. So the idea here is that we have our sine inverse of x, and this is equal to some value y, right? And I want to figure out what the derivative of this is. Well, let's rewrite this, right, with this if and only if statement as x is equal to sine y. Now this we can take the derivative of, uh, and we're doing it implicitly with respect to x. So the derivative of x is 1, the derivative of sine is cosine, and then because it's derivative with respect to x, right, we have to use the chain rule, so this is then times y prime. So therefore, y prime is equal to 1 minus sorry, one divided by cosine of y. All right, so, but I want it just in x's, right? I don't want y's, I want x's. So how can I get this in terms of x's? So the way that we're gonna do this is we're gonna use the Pythagorean theorem. And the version of the Pythagorean theorem that says that sine squared of y, oops, sine squared of y plus cosine squared of y equals one. Okay, the idea here is that I know that sine of y is equal to x, right? So sine of y is equal to x, so I can substitute that all in. And so I can solve cosine squared of y is equal to one minus x. Well, ooh, sorry, uh, I made a mistake there. x squared, right, because it's sine squared of y. There we go. Now I can take the square root on both sides, and I get the square root of one minus x squared. And it should be the positive one based on the domain. The domain's right. Uh, from negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, all that time, right, cosine is positive. So therefore, it's the positive one. And that's how you get the formula. That's why the derivative of sine inverse is this 1 over root 1 minus x squared. All right, so now let's actually use it. We have a nice example here. Uh, let's solve this example. Uh, it looks like we have quite a chain rule system going on here. So if I take the derivative of sine inverse, right, that's going to give me 1 over the square root of 1 minus a bunch of stuff squared, right? So it's going to be the natural log of 3x squared, That all that stuff squared. Now, with the chain rule, I need to take the derivative of the inside. So the derivative of the natural log is 1 over whatever's inside there. So that's 3x squared. And then the chain rule again, right? The derivative of 3x squared is 6x. So I see there's a little bit of cancellation that happens here. And so it looks like my final answer, I should have a 2 on top. Uh, it looks like I have 1x on bottom. And then all of this stuff, right? The square root of 1 minus 
the quantity, natural log, of the quantity of 3x squared, all that squared. Whew. All right, and that should be my final answer. So there's the derivative. And basically, the only thing new here was that sine inverse uh, formula. All right, now likewise, you can talk about uh, the inverse cosine function, or sometimes you may hear this referred to as arc cosine. And likewise, the inverse is defined if and only if cosine of y equals x. And you notice that the domain on this is slightly different than it is for sine, right? So this needs to be y between 0 and pi in order for cosine to have an inverse. Cosine inverse will also satisfy some cancellation equations. So if you apply cosine inverse to cosine, it'll cancel out. And if you apply cosine to cosine inverse, it'll also cancel out. And again, you have to be a little bit careful about your domain, right? What are the allowable values that you can plug in to cosine or cosine inverse? When you take the derivative of cosine inverse, well, uh, you get almost the same thing as sine inverse, but you have a negative sign. So negative 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So that's pretty interesting there. And then finally, why don't we talk a little bit about inverse tangent function, or sometimes this is referred to as arc tangent. Likewise, tan tangent inverse of x is equal to y if and only if tangent of y is equal to x. We restrict into kind of this one period between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, right? Uh, and actually, at these points, y equals pi over 2 and y equals negative pi over 2, these are horizontal asymptotes of the graph of tangent inverse. So another way to write that uh, is that if you take the limit as x goes to infinity of tangent inverse of x, you will head towards the positive one, positive pi over 2. And if you head towards negative infinity, you will head, uh, the tangent inverse will approach negative pi over 2. And then finally, uh, again, you can take a derivative, uh, but actually let's uh, pause for a second and let me sketch this a little bit. So I'm going to uh, show you what these inverses are. Right, so let's, here's an x and here's a y. And I'm going to draw a tangent uh, and tangent inverse. So I know tangent looks something like this, uh, and it has vertical asymptotes between uh, pi over 2 and negative pi over 2, and then it technically continues on. But right, in order to have a inverse function, it needs to pass the horizontal line test. So you actually won't go beyond just the one period. Now the inverse function, right, is this reflection across the line y equals x. So if I try to reflect this across the line y equals x, I get something like this red picture here. And the idea is those purple vertical asymptotes become horizontal asymptotes for the inverse function. So you can see uh, for this red function, the inverse function, as you head towards positive infinity, you're getting closer and closer to pi over 2. And as you head towards negative infinity, you get closer and closer to negative pi over 2. And notice this indeed uh, meets the restriction. It's between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. All right, so let's write down really quick then what the derivative is. And we'll actually sketch some more of these uh, inverse functions here in just a minute. So the derivative of tangent inverse is going to be 1 over 1 plus x squared. And the claim is that you could solve this just like you did before for sine inverse. All right, like I mentioned, uh, I want to give you some graphs, some intuitive ideas of what these functions actually look like. So I added some points here on these graphs. You could do the same. Uh, and the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a sine. So we know sine of 0 is 0. Uh, we know sine of pi over 2 is going to be 1. And we know uh, sine of negative pi over 2 is going to be negative 1. So this is what sine looks like. And it continues on. Uh, but past these points, it doesn't pass the horizontal line test. So it won't have an inverse. So that's why we have to restrict down to just this domain. All right, now if I was to reflect this across the line y equals x, so I'll do my best to draw this line y equals x here. If you were to reflect that, well, instead of the point pi over 2 comma 1, you'd get 1 comma pi over 2. 0, 0 stays the same, and then I'd have negative 1 comma negative pi over 2. And so my graph would look something like this. 
So now, since I really just want the graph of sine inverse, I'm going to erase the rest of it. Uh, but you don't necessarily have to or anything. And you can see, right, if this was to continue on, then sine inverse wouldn't pass the vertical line test, and therefore it wouldn't be a function. So that's why we have to, again, restrict this domain, and that's why the horizontal line test makes sense. All right, let's play the game again with cosine inverse. So I'm going to first draw cosine. And for cosine inverse, we restrict between 0 and pi. So here's what cosine looks like between 0 and pi. And you'll notice that this passes the horizontal line test. But if you were to continue on, it wouldn't. So that's why we restrict down to that domain. Now, if we go ahead and we try to reflect it across the line y equals x, so here's my line y equals x, I would get something like, and let me use my red pen, uh, well, one point would be 1, 0. And then another point would be uh, 0 pi over 2. And then another point would be negative 1 pi. And hopefully this purple line and this red line looks like you know the same thing, except for it's just been reflected across this pink line, the line y equals x. So now I can erase all this. And this is what cosine inverse looks like. Finally, we've already kind of done uh, tangent inverse, but let's go over it one more time in case if it was confusing last time. So I know tangent has vertical asymptotes at negative pi over 2 and pi over 2. So here's what tangent looks like. And again, I have to restrict to this domain because if I were to include any more points, it wouldn't pass the horizontal line test. So now if I reflect this across the line y equals x, the claim is those vertical tangent, those vertical asymptotes become horizontal asymptotes. So that's my red lines there. And then let's go ahead and try our best to reflect. That's kind of what a reflection looks like. There's kind of a reflection. All right, so I get this crazy looking picture. And if I delete all this stuff that doesn't really have to do with tangent inverse, my resulting picture should be just the red stuff here. So this is what tangent inverse is. And interestingly enough, right, uh, tangent inverse, its domain is all the real numbers, right? It goes on forever. You don't have any problems. You don't have to restrict between negative 1 and 1 like we did for sine inverse and cosine inverse. OK, so let's try to figure out what the uh, derivative looks like. So the derivative for sine inverse, the claim is at 0, it's positive. I think it's around 1 or so. Um, and I know that it's restrictive, right? The derivative is only going to exist between negative 1 and 1. And it seems like it's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Likewise, as you get closer and closer to negative 1, that slope gets bigger and bigger and bigger as well. So I think the graph's going to look something like this, but let's spend a little time to graph it, right? We're told, or actually we solve for sine inverse, that this is supposed to be 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared. So let's see what that graph actually looks like. And we can see, ah, this is promising. Let me try to zoom in a little bit more. And yeah, we can see it actually crosses exactly at 1. And then it has these nice vertical asymptotes as you get closer and closer to 1 and negative 1. So I think our graph, our sketch of a graph, did a pretty good job. So this intuitively makes sense uh, for what the formula should be. Now for cosine inverse, taking a look at it, it looks very similar to sine inverse. When you start thinking about the slope, the only thing is that uh, the slope is always negative, it looks like. So at the point 0, it looks like the slope is around negative 1. And then the slope gets smaller and smaller and smaller the closer that you get to 1 and negative 1. And this, again, intuitively makes sense with the uh, function that we know, right? It's supposed to be the exact same as sine inverse, just with a negative. So there's sine inverses right here. And cosine inverse is the exact same, but it's negative. So it's been flipped over this uh, x-axis. And that's indeed what we see here based on the picture. Now we could graph it to verify, but I'm pretty confident for this one. And now let's think about tangent inverse. So tangent inverse at 0, it looks like the slope's positive. I would say maybe it's around 1-ish. So I'm going to plot 1. I know it's positive. All right. And then let's go ahead and see. It, it gets It's positive all the time, but it seems to get closer and closer to 0. 
So the slope's always positive, but it's leveling out. Let's see what our equation gives us, right? Our equation 1 over 1 plus x squared should be the derivative of tangent inverse. So let's, I'm going to make this half the screen. Ooh, fighting with this thing. And yeah, I mean, it looks a lot like our picture here. And in fact, it does cross 1, and then it seems to kind of level out. All right, I think that's probably a good place for us to take a break and stretch our legs. Join us next time in video two, where we'll go over a few more definitions and a lot more examples. I'll see you then.